So I'm going to introduce um, Adrian Vanzil. Um, he's a co-founder and CEO of Ardent Capital. And his, the topic of his uh, talk is the Global VC Southeast Asia. And also his uh, Twitter handle is Adrian, V-A-N-Z-Y-L. And just a um, quick introduction on Adrian is he actually um, built his career here in, in Silicon Valley as an investor. And now he's taken the wild and crazy step of actually going to Southeast Asia to kick off the ecosystem there. So I'll let you take it all. Thank you. Thank you. So the wild and crazy step of moving to Southeast Asia. So let me tell you a bit about that. So um, we are based in Bangkok. I live in Bangkok. That is actually our office right in the middle of that picture there. What I was going to do today, before about an hour ago, is go through about 30 really wonderfully data dense slides about why Southeast Asia is the right place to go. But I think what would be much more interesting is to share with you guys what we at Ardent went through. Like what were the crazy things we assumed that turned out to be completely ludicrously untrue? And where are we seeing great opportunities today? So I am going to show you just three slides to set context, but really want to drill into our experience and then look at the venture capital ecosystem from a startup entrepreneur's point of view and then look at it from a venture capitalist point of view. Who are you competing with? Where are the deals coming from? What do the exits look like? So let's jump into this. Three data slides. The moral of this first one is very simple. Southeast Asia is huge. 600 million people, twice the size of the US. In the next four years, there will be more people online in Southeast Asia than the entire population of the US. Every metric you could possibly track about the internet is growing at 30% compound growth. Everything is happening super fast. And why is that? Well, we are in the midst of half a dozen or so major trends that are all happening at exactly the same time and are all cumulative in their effect. They are rising GDP and disposable income. They are growing mobile broadband penetration. Everything is being leapfrogged in Southeast Asia. There is no DSL. There are very few desktops. It's all mobile 4G laptop tablets. Smartphone penetration is disproportionate to GDP. And the reason for that is the last point. Everything is social. You cannot have a life, a social life, or a career if you are not on the major messenger platforms. Line, for example, in less than two years came out of nowhere to now have larger reach than Facebook in countries like Thailand. That is phenomenal. Zero to that in two years. So a slide to really show this specific point is what happened in China post the introduction of 3G and what happened in Thailand. What took China three years took Thailand two years. And the point of this is the growth and the acceleration for each new country entering this online space. Everything is happening faster, leapfrogging technology and getting to the same points as the US, Europe, China in literally a fraction of the time. So those are the only three data slides I want to show you. The other 30 are at the end of this deck for anyone who wants to look online. So let me tell you a bit about our journey and our experience and how we got to doing what we're doing. So we call ourselves an operator VC. We're based in Thailand, but we invest across all of Southeast Asia. So we have investments all the way from Sri Lanka to Indonesia to Singapore to Thailand to Philippines and everywhere in between. We invest and we build. And this is the journey that I want to share with you. When you go into a brand new ecosystem with no internet in it at all, the ecosystem develops in three very distinct phases. The first one is the build phase. You go in there crazy enough to think the internet's going to be big and you build basic infrastructure, you build ad networks, you build e-commerce businesses, you do really basic stuff. And you do it yourself because there's no one for you to invest into because the system doesn't exist yet. So that's exactly what we did. The first 10 years, the founding team of Ardent went and built businesses. We built three, we exited three, we generated about $110 million in returns, and we built three of the largest internet businesses in the region. 
That was phase one. The next phase is phase three, which is where you invest. And I'm deliberately skipping phase two because we didn't realize there was a phase two. So we thought, okay, we're smart, we've got capital, we've got network and experience. Let's go take the US early stage venture model and apply it in Southeast Asia. We'll do little work, make a lot of money. This is going to be absolutely awesome. Disaster. So three years ago, we started with what we now know as phase three and looked at dozens and dozens of companies. And with the notable exception of some really awesome ones, most of what we saw was complete crap. It was founders with no experience, no ambition beyond their own cities, really, really very difficult to find good investments three years ago. So that's when we discovered that middle step, phase two, which is the build and operate model. The guys who have perfected that are Rocket Internet. And for those of you who don't know who Rocket is, a bunch of crazy Germans attacking every emerging market in the world, they have built two big businesses in Southeast Asia and invested over half a billion US dollars just in Southeast Asia, just in those businesses. That is the build and operate model, and that's where we've ended up as well. We do both build and operate and invest because of the market maturity. So what does that look like? So I want to give you an example of a business that we have built and funded as an example of this. But before I do that, I want to explain the why I have the word elephant up there. So this morning, everyone's talking about unicorns, right? Beautiful, amazing, mythical creatures that make a billion dollars for the investors. We don't have a lot of unicorns in Southeast Asia. We have a lot of elephants. And what I mean by that is these are basic businesses, Web 1.0 businesses, solving hard problems that are unlikely to be billion dollar businesses in the short term, but are very solid hundred million dollar businesses. So the opportunity in Southeast Asia today is to go build 10 hundred million dollar elephant style basic building block businesses and leave the unicorns to the Americans out here where it's unlikely you need a very mature ecosystem, you need a lot of capital. We're going to build a whole bunch of elephants. So I think the, the moral here is those basic businesses should not be discounted and just because they're not particularly glamorous or sexy, they still make a lot of money. So the point with this slide is we've built a business called e-commerce, which is a basic Web 1.0 infrastructure business. If you want to do e-commerce in Southeast Asia and sell direct to the 600 million people in Southeast Asia, you very quickly discover you need a warehouse. You need people who can pick and pack. You need a fleet of motorbikes. You need a large call center. You need payment gateways. You need cash on delivery. Sexy? No. Glamorous? No. Critical, essential, massive, important? Absolutely. So we built this business in one year from zero to 250 employees in four countries with 40 global brands as customers. That's a great business. It's not a unicorn, but damn, it's a good business. So it's a good example of what's possible. So that's our context of what we're doing and how we got there. I want to look a bit at the venture capital world from an entrepreneur's perspective in Southeast Asia. So I'm going to start by looking at it from a non-Singaporean perspective. So if you're a great entrepreneur in Malaysia, or Indonesia, or Thailand, how hard is it to raise capital? The answer is, it's really, really, really hard. Everyone you talk to from an angel perspective wants to see your factory. They want to touch the stuff you have. The stuff that sits in the cloud and that is virtual is very difficult for a traditional investor to understand. So angel money is out there, but very difficult to get because you're not just educating your investors about what you're doing, you're actually educating them about a whole class of investment opportunity that they've never seen. So as a young entrepreneur, you start in your own local market, you'll eventually raise some money from uh, the traditional friends, family and fools universe, and you'll get your business up and running. 
but you'll grow it really slowly because you're really growing out of cash flow. So you're very conservative. You add one employee at a time. You know that if you can't meet payroll, no one's going to come in and rescue you or your company. So very conservative, very slow growth. So what do you do next? Well, if you're entrepreneurial and well-connected, you get on a plane and you go to Singapore. Singapore is where all the money sits in Southeast Asia, but it is money with enormous strings attached. And I'm going to drill into this in a moment because Singapore is incredibly important in Southeast Asia. It has less than 1% of the population of Southeast Asia, but it's where all the money sits. So I'll come back to that one in just a moment. Then the next thing you do as a young entrepreneur is you go to Japan. For us, this is where most of the money for what we've been doing has come from. Japan is a wonderful place to raise capital because it has a lot of capital. It is a country where people are aware of Southeast Asia, so you don't have to go through the educational process. And it's a country where the larger investors are keen to grow into Southeast Asia. So it's a great place to raise capital, but quite complex. And for anyone who has raised money out of Japan, the due diligence process is, uh, is onerous. Let me put it that way. So what's the solution? We need more venture money in Southeast Asia. So to just use Ardent as an example again, our money has come from primarily the US, some from, sorry, primarily from Japan, some from the US. But look at our major, major country for co-investment is Japan. We have in the last 18 months co-invested with NTT Docomo, with Sumitomo, with Recruit, with GMO, with big Japanese conglomerates that are all coming into the region. So that's where the money is, but it's very complicated. If you are a young Indonesian, Malaysian entrepreneur, your access and ability to get on a plane and get these meetings, is, it's tough, it's really tough. So it's difficult to raise, but the money is there. So let's keep looking outside of Singapore. So if you're a successful entrepreneur and you've built your business up and you've scaled it to about 30, 40 people, you've got some real revenues, you need $2 million to really now scale, to go from single country to multiple countries in the region, hire more people, get more assets, all the things you need to do, you need $2 million. Where do you go to raise that money? Are there any Series A, US style Series A, so two million plus investors in Vietnam? Not really. Are there any in the Philippines? Not really. Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, same problem. The PE money is there. If you go to the wealthy families and conglomerates, you can raise 10 or 20 million. If you want to raise 100,000, you can. That gap in the middle that we talk about in the US as the Series A gap, in Southeast Asia, that problem is 10 times greater. There is almost no Series A level money in Southeast Asia, excluding Singapore. So let's talk about Singapore. If you are a venture investor coming into Southeast Asia, your primary competitor for everything is Singapore Inc. Singapore, the country, Singapore, the business, Singapore, the investor. It is a formidable force. There is more money in Singapore's sovereign wealth fund than the entire US venture capital ecosystem. That is amazing. So they have single-handedly bootstrapped Singapore into being the number one player in the region. They have funded many, many venture funds with the most wonderful scheme you will ever hear of, which is for every dollar you put in as an investor, they'll give you $5 essentially for free because you can buy them out the day before you exit the business for a little bit of interest. Best deal ever for a venture investor. They also have uh, larger funds, which are one for one matching, but the bottom line is lots and lots and lots of capital available at the early stage level. At the bigger level, where you need 10, 20, 30, 50 million dollars, Again, Singapore government money just sloshing through the system. So if you are investing in Southeast Asia, you will be 100% guaranteed co-investing with or competing with Singapore government-related money. 
What that ecosystem has done now as well, it's brought in all the big Japanese investors to set up office. And some of the notable ones that are very active in the region there are Rakuten and Green now as well. So if you would like to join us and run a fund in Southeast Asia, how difficult is it? Well, coups and other issues notwithstanding, your number one challenge is actually staff. It's talent. That is the single biggest growth limiting factor for everything we see and do in Southeast Asia is finding awesome people. So that's your number one challenge. The next one is deal flow. If you're coming from outside of the country, how do you get into good deal flow? You have to partner up. Legal is worthy of an entire two hour session on its own. So I'll skip that for the moment and talk quickly about exits. The very counterintuitive thing in Southeast Asia is it's not intellectual property that drives your valuation. It is the number of talented people you have on the ground that are difficult for an acquirer to replicate. If you've got 300 smart people doing sales support, et cetera, in three countries in three different languages, that's a valuable asset. Not your IP. An acquirer is going to take your IP and replace it with their own. So very counterintuitive. Big companies, lots of people, lots of feet on the ground equals value, not so much IP. All right, last slide. You cannot operate in Southeast Asia by flying in for a week at a time. It just doesn't work that way. You've actually got to get on a plane, move across, get into the local ecosystem, build the relationship. There is no other way. Southeast Asia is not a place. It is a region on a map with six entirely different groups of people, languages, cultures, currencies, laws, regulations, complexities. It's difficult to assess this if you're not physically on the ground. Ownership restrictions are severe. Some countries will not allow foreign ownership. Some will if you know how to use the legal system. You need to get your holding company in the right spot. You need local partners. So I'm going to finish with one line that says, we need more investment in the region. The opportunities for growth are profound. Our current fund for over the last year and a half since we last raised money is returning an ROI of about 40% and a TVPI of about 1.6. So the numbers are absolutely phenomenal. So if you're brave enough, Come join us. We'd love to talk some more. Thank you.